Hello, welcome everybody. It's really great to see so many friends joining from all over the world. Um, yeah, great that you're here. Um, we will start in about one minute. It's amazing seeing so many comments coming in from all over the world. We've got from the Netherlands, from India, from Ohio, Colorado, from South Africa. Gosh, quite an international group of people, which is amazing as this project and this topic is such a, an amazing international issue. And our panel here today is spread across almost every time zone you can imagine from morning to night. So. I'm really happy to see that our attendees are equally diverse and coming in from so many different places and that you all have an interest in beehive fences and in elephant conservation. And yeah, I'm really excited that we can all uh, learn together and, and discuss together today. So let's see, it's about eight o'clock now. Why don't we get started? And as people keep signing in, they can, yeah, listen to our introductions. Juan, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and Future for Nature Academy. Sure. So, hi everyone. Uh, as David said, this is a big pleasure for me to be here and a big pleasure to, to see these great, great events. It's amazing to see that everyone keeps popping up and from all over the place in the world. And uh, also our panel, panel members are everywhere pretty much, from uh, America to Asia. It's just amazing. So, yeah, this is great. So yeah, my name is Juan. I'm from the Future Furniture Academy. That, uh, from those that don't, don't know us, uh, we are a, a group of students uh, in the Netherlands or, or young conservationists that we try to promote nature conservation and our passion, passion for, for nature to the general public. And we do that through different events like uh, the one of today. And we try to, most, most of all, to try to inspire people basically our passion for nature, our care for nature, because as we all know, we are in a biodiversity crisis and we need to care nature and we need to protect it. So we try to, to do these kind of events uh, and try to inspire everyone to, to care about our beautiful world. So yeah, today is amazing to be here. I'm really eager to learn about elephants and, and bees and how they can be a solution for human conflicts. And uh, yeah, today we have also David Owen, who is the project manager of Bring Elephants Home, and uh, he's going to be the, the host of today. I will keep an eye on all your questions through the chat, and uh, later today we'll have a Q&A with all our panelists, so uh, we will ask those questions. So the floor is yours, David. Awesome. Thanks so much, Juan. That's great. We've loved working with Future for Nature Academy, so thank you so much for the introduction. Um, my name is David Owen, and I'm the project manager for Bring the Elephant Home here in Thailand. Um, Bring the Elephant Home was founded about 16 years ago, and we focus on community-based conservation efforts here in Thailand, and actually have active projects in South Africa, and uh, a group of very active, passionate volunteers in the Netherlands as well. We focus our work predominantly on engaging with community members who are passionate about elephant conservation, restoring and building a healthy ecology through reforestation programs, and overall just highlighting and showing the benefits that um, exist in ranges where elephants and humans share space. So our goal is to create coexistence between humans, elephants, and the landscapes in which they live. And um, we're in a perfect spot to talk about that with beehive fences and beehive fence experts from all over the world. So continue commenting, and uh, Juan and I are going to get to those comments. But first, I'd like to introduce um, our first speaker, if it's possible, who's going to talk about this international collaboration that we had in publishing um, this scientific publication. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Kevin Madison, who is an ecologist and pollination biologist with a research focus on urbanized landscapes. Dr. Madison currently serves as the Associate Director of Master's Programs for Project Dra Dragonfly, an inquiry-based conservation initiative offered by Miami University. Um, he also is a supervisor of both Antoinette's research and my research as well. So quite a special person. <laughs> Dr. Kevin Madison, why don't you take it away and talk a little bit about the collaboration of this paper? Sure. Thanks, uh, David. And hello, everyone, wherever you are um, joining us. It's, it's cool for my screen view right now. It looks like the Brady Bunch here with all these 
panelists that are that are doing great work on the ground in different countries. Um, like David said, I'm in Ohio. I work at Miami University with Project Dragonfly, um, which is a graduate program where folks from all over the world can join and get involved in conservation and do online coursework, plus travel to different countries and biodiversity hotspots. So that's actually how I met Antoinette uh, first back in 2015. We were in Belize for a course I was instructing. Um, and even though Belize has no elephants, um, <laughs> we talked a good about it, bit about elephants um, and really the conservation issues that are facing the world are kind of similar, uh, regardless of whatever species you're looking at or what country you're in. The Really the big challenge is how can we live with different species, um, not just put them in nature preserves or think that, you know, they can be set away from humans. Um, so I was really excited to hear about Antoinette's work in Thailand, um, where she had created a nonprofit and was working with elephants and also more importantly working with people um, and trying to engage people in conservation. Um, so that is one of the, the critical things we need to talk about today. I think it's, sorry for the pun, but it's the elephant in the room, uh, if you will, of uh, conservation, which is that we have to engage people in the effort. So um, it's not really about Beehive, I mean, Beehive Fence is great, we're really excited about it, but that is just one innovative conservation action. And more than anything, it's a way to bring people together, um, to bring folks together that might not otherwise talk. And it definitely gets people excited and um, thinking outside the box. So that's one of the things I, I think is great about it. I do think those of us um, that don't live in countries with elephants, maybe we just start to think about like, you know, save the elephants and that's kind of it. Um, not realizing that this is a seven ton animal that can, um, you know, cause damage to crops um, and really impact people's livelihoods. Um, and so people that are living on the edges of these rural areas where there are nature preserves for elephants, um, they are trying to find a way to coexist peacefully, um, but the elephants can be quite problematic. I think here in Ohio, people, my, my neighbors complain about deer um, <laughs> eating, eating a hosta or nibbling some of their garden plants. And I think, um, wow, you know, I don't know if our patients here would be that great for dealing with elephants. Um, so if we can do it with elephants, if we can find a way to coexist with elephants, I th again, I think we can, we can do that with many, many species. Um, some of the things that, that were really interesting um, from Antoinette's uh, surveys in these different communities um, was, was that 80% of people living in these areas have experienced a negative impact of living with elephants over the last five years. Um, whether it was damage to their crops, like I said, or other structures on their property, or just fear of um, being harmed inadvertently or hurt by elephants. Um, and 90%, um, the vast majority, had not received any benefits thus far from living with elephants. So it's quite a challenge, quite a challenge to reverse those uh, trends. Um, and that's really what we're trying to talk about today. Um, so I'm really excited to hear what everyone has to say from different countries. I think in academia, we sometimes forget um, to do this kind of outreach. We just publish our paper and hope people read it. Um, uh, so for Antoinette and Future for Nature Academy and everyone that's organized this, um, I think it's fan fantastic to get the conversation going. Um, and if you're joining us and you're an elephant expert already, I know we have quite a few people joining in who already do this as part of their work. So thank you so much for joining. Um, if you're new to all this, hopefully this is the beginning of a journey and it will just continue um, after this talk. Um, so yeah, just, just another welcome and uh, a few thoughts. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's fantastic to kind of align this idea of Beehive Fences, which are such a community-based effort, and Project Dragonfly in Miami University, which is, again, yeah, so focused on community-based conservation and realizing the, the importance of aligning benefits that communities, wildlife, and, um, and nature sees. So we're gonna move on to our next speaker, who I could not be more proud to introduce. 
dare I call her the queen bee. <laughs> Dr. Lucy King is the head of Save the Elephants, Human Elephant Coexistence Program and Elephants and Bees Project Leader. She's been researching the use of honeybees as a natural deterrent for crop raiding elephants since 2006 and has published her findings in numerous scientific journals. She won the Future for Nature Award and the St. Andrews Prize for the Environment in 2013. She's actively involved in the Kenyan Elephant Forum. And in 2013, she was invited to join IUCN's African Elephant Specialist Group. Dr. Lucy King has also supervised the Beehive Fence Study in Thailand that we're discussing today since it started in 2016. So go ahead, Dr. Lucy King. We're so excited to hear what you have to say about updates from the Beehive Fence Projects in Asia and Africa. Well, thank you so much. And what an exciting webinar to be part of. It's amazing to see my Beehive Fence, Beehive Fence friends from all over the world joining on this. Um, and I can't wait to go and visit every one of your sites. So it's, uh, the Beehive Fences are growing so fast, I haven't managed to get to every site, but it's, it's really, really thrilling for me to see our research that started you know, 15, 16 years ago now, expanding around the world. And I'm talking to you here from my research center in Savo, where we are absolutely roasting. You know, it's at the end of a very long dry season. And this year has been so difficult for so many people. Um, it's just exacerbated the problems of climate change, of communities being forced to live with elephants. And now, of course, with this massive health crisis that we're dealing with and that the problems are, are feel insurmountable sometimes. And then you realize that there's a network of conservationists trying so hard out there. Um, and the more we work together and talk and help each other, the more success we're going to have for elephant conservation. Um, and it's so heartening to have um, groups like this who are interested in, in our kind of human elephant coexistence work. So here we're really trying in Kenya to do a network of different methods to reduce conflict between people and elephants. And beehive fences are at the core of that. And, and we've been working with this idea in it, developing it, improving it, learning from all our mistakes since around 2006. And it's really become quite an effective method for reducing conflict, not only because the bees scare away the elephants and it keeps the elephants out of the farms, but the pollination services are really boosting farm productivity and the honey and beeswax are this wonderful extra addition that uh, farmers can sell and make some small money just to help them with those tough times. Uh, and as we all know, bees are suffering hugely around the world as well. It's, um, I mean, the worst stories are from North America, but the rest of the planet is also really struggling with bees. You know, vegetation is being cut down as the climate dries up and changes or erratic rainfall is happening. We're also seeing that impact. And I never knew from my work that I'd actually start to study the decline of honeybees in some of our areas as well. So this is a really integrated project that a real conservation community based project. Um, and so I've had the privilege of having several of you on the panel to my research center here. Um, many, many young people coming to learn about our beehive fences, going off around the world. And then I've been so delighted to collaborate with lots of different trial sites around Africa um, and now into Asia. So we have around four or five sites uh, in, in Asia trying beehive fences and the rest in Africa. In total, 19 countries are now testing this idea of beehive fences in around 74 different sites. I have to say every single site is different. So we, we're trying really hard to piece together all the data, but the best thing is that every site can be different. There is no one answer to human elephant conflict. There, there is no one silver bullet. Beehive fences are a fabulous tool in the toolbox, but we have to look at this whole myriad, a whole op a suite of options of how to live with elephants. Um, and that's what we're doing here in Savo, trying non-palatable crops, building watchtowers, um, testing all sorts of different olfactory and, um, or to, and uh, audible deterrents, a lot of education, women bioenterprise projects, trying to basically support people to live with elephants. Um, and our friends in India, Dr. Prachi Mehta, she's doing amazing work out there. Um, I can't wait to go and visit all her sites. She's got hundreds of beehives up now in amongst all her other projects. We have Kylie Butler who helped us in Sri Lanka, which was so fantastic. And Robert and Michelle down in South Africa working with some of the Southern African projects. Um, and testing beehives to protect trees. And then this fabulous Thailand project, which really has been a success. I was so privileged to be on your paper and to help you with your ideas. Um, and the results were really interesting. And I think this is gonna be a trigger for more and more support, more of a holistic approach to living with elephants. 
So I thank all of you for joining us. And for those of you listening to our talk, please consider supporting some of the projects here. Um, the one thing about human elephant coexistence is grant money is very small. So people are working with the largest possible animal with the smallest possible budgets. Um, and it seems very disproportionate. So thank you for your support, both emotionally and practically. Um, and happy to answer your questions at the end, but good luck to the rest of my panelists. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you so much, Dr. Lucy King. So, yeah, so inspiring to hear you speak about the project globally. Um, and I hope that we can get some time later to talk about how just your feelings and perspective in watching the project grow and take off. Um, I also love the world's biggest animal with the smallest budget. That's definitely something I'm going to, yeah, use later on. So I hope you don't mind. I'll credit you though. Um, and I've also thrown in Dr. Lucy King's TED Talk, which congratulations just hit 2 million views, if I'm correct. Um, so I put that in the chat as well. So please do take a look. Um, thank you, Dr. Lucy King. So next we have uh, an amazing colleague and close friend of mine who I'm so proud to introduce to all of you, uh, Kun Rataya Arkajak, is going to talk a little bit about updates from the Beehive Fence Project here in Thailand. So Rataya Arkajak is a researcher at the Puluang Wildlife Research Station, a branch of the Department of National Parks, Wildlife and Plant Conservation in Thailand. Rataya and her team support Beehive Fence owners surrounding five forest complex in Thailand through ongoing training and best practices for beekeeping, which has been a key element to the project's success. Currently, Rachaya is completing her PhD research at King Mongkut's Institute of Technology, Latkapang, on factors and methods that incentivize wild elephants to remain inside of protected areas. Welcome, Kunataya. Are you able to share your slides with us? She has a presentation to share with us that I think you'll all enjoy. Yeah, okay. Good evening from Thailand. I'm so exciting and the first time to the met the family of behind fan and the first time for talk about Dr. Lucy King is a big queen about and inspiration me to the about the elephant. Yeah, I show my presentation. Well, while Rache pulls up her presentation, um, I'd just like to share about her work a little bit more and that her team is constantly traveling around Thailand to the to every corner and border of the country to support beehive fence owners and do trainings and um, to teach people about the the project so as you watch this presentation I hope you also know how many hours of travel went into it and to supporting it <laughs> go ahead Ratea. thank you okay you saw my presentation Yes, you can. Okay, I put it on in the Thailand. The elephant is a big problem in Thailand. I think I there's a big problem in the all the world. Now this is Jantaburi Ganghang Mao. This is a internet project and me and my team Pulong Wildlife Research Station. This is the big heart of the elephant that have many many uh female elephant but with a big herd and I think my uh, duty I protect the elephant but in the real situation I cannot protect elephant only I must protect the human but I find the solution for the human elephant coexist this is the situation in Thailand. Human die and elephant die. I think there's a big solution, a big problem in Thailand. Uh, the, I think the factor, the main factor in Thailand is the food plant attractive outside elephant outside the protected area. The cassava, uh, banana, and sugar cane is a big factor for Thailand. They come outside. But when we, when we met the harmony solution, I think I find many, many solutions. When we met a harmony solution, this is the behind fan, Dr. Lucy King. I think, uh, the, oh, this is uh, in turn for the, this problem because I have a two duty to protect the human and protect the elephant. 
I think about five years ago, my work has a, a learning and studying about the 11 behavior. But what they eat, why they out, then how I do. I think the when 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 I I met the solution, I think oh this is the entrance. Kenya to Thailand about twenty twelve. Uh, in Thailand, I started this project about five years ago. I first time I have a manual construction, Dr. Lucy King. I implement the you uh, set up about the behind fence, how how wrong the, uh, how this stand about the behind box. I set up about seven nests behind per be, behind between behind and dummy. But in Asian elephant, the my elephant is a knock 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 for find the real real bee in the box. But when they know this uh, empty box, they go inside the corn field. I I try to the I try to the solution for wow is a uh, Asian elephant they can they can try to the uh in in, in inside the uh, farm the corn. I now in Thailand this stand about the box behind fence about six minutes and the frequency loot the elephant I this stand about three point five minutes is the efficiency. This is the first video in uh, five years ago. Is seven per box. The elephant near the behind fence, and they try to uh, eat the call inside. But when they saw this is the box, I think they they think and they they turn around not come in the night. It's a success and a really happy to the situation. Uh, first time I have a 26 behind pen, but don't have man, uh, no, not, not more for the course in the farm call. And uh, this is uh, around the Thailand. I have a uh, many many video to the lesson learned for the behind fan interaction about elephant and behind fan i think the successful about the behind fan and elephant interaction i think this is a human and good beekeeper because when the bee is strong and big colony enough the efficiency of the behind fence is a good and 100%, I think. <laughs> because if uh, the human don't choose this solution, not efficiency. Uh, in Thailand, the, I, I, I choose the Apis uh, mellifera because in Thailand have uh, this, this, uh, this species in the uh, about 20 years, 20 years to the in, inside European species in, in Thailand. We should and they make and many, many honey for the uh, villager for the beekeeper. Now, uh, I have um, about, about, about five years ago, I have about uh, 10 beekeeper, but now in the I have uh, five beekeeper because I think the when we when we teach when we uh, sharing about this project, I think the important point is uh, they choose, but first time they think is a uh, suitable for them, but in the in the future they they think is uh, not suitable for them. I think uh, is a uh, uh, up, up to them when it's now is a good behavior in Thailand I have the five people to the sustainable uh, about 
three years ago, they used this behind fence to protect themselves, to take home, protect crop. In Thailand, I think it's a successful in the beekeeper. And I think I more, more, more the behind fence, more the benefit in behind fence. I think the learning about the 11 behavior to protect them. When they know the behavior of elephant, I think they choose the solution for the harmony solution. This is the uh, important point, alternative income, because in Thailand, the people uh, have the, this problem. There is a, uh, about poor person, but if they have uh, alternative income, they uh, not violent for coexist. This is the real farm in the Chantaburi. It's a one house and uh, uh, all family inside your home and the beehive fan can protect life them. I think this is a wonderful the solution to protect life for them. Not, uh, but not more explain. I think the variable this, this two is a, when they choose, they have a three objective. One, protect, protect the home. Two, alternative income. And three, they decrease the human elephant conflict. Uh, I try to the uh, this farm in the behind fence farm. Try to the plant the flower for honey, plant the tree for honey, and learning to the coexist near the elephant. And and now I try to spread this solution to. Uh, everybody to interact with the harmony solution and learning about behavior eleven. But I think uh, because I think if they know the behavior, they can choose the solution. This is a dream, my dream. When they planting, this is a rice farm. They have a behind fence. This farm in the Lai province in Thailand, the 100% can protect life few more than three years ago. And now they use the behind fence. This is a, a farm with internet and being even home visits first time in this farm. Okay, thank you from Thailand and really happy to see you all. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Kunrache. That's amazing and so, so informative. Um, and great to see all of those images and videos, um, not only of the beehives and the fences in action, but also of the, the farmers and the community members. Um, and maybe just to give all of our attendees and other panelists some insight, like when I say that her team travels, I mean, 10, 12, 15 hours apart, constantly going and you know, I've had the privilege of meeting many beehive fence owners here in Thailand and all of them say that the reason why they keep the project going is because they have a network that um, Rachea, the Pulung Wildlife Research Station and Bring the Elephant Home have worked to, to create. So it's not just about these individual farmers setting up their beehive. I think, I hope Rachea, you agree that a real key to the success is creating this network of people that support each other and share experiences. So. Um, thank you so much for all of that information. Um, so next, very, very important presentation, and I'm really excited to introduce um, somebody who, yeah, somebody who's passionate about uniting nature, wildlife, elephants, and humans, and bringing benefits to all of them. And I think one of the few people who's able to unite such an international group of panelists and co-authors for her paper, but um, I'd like to introduce Antoinette Van Tewater. 
Um, in 2004, Antoinette Vandewater founded Bring the Elephant Home, a nonprofit organization working towards a world in which people and elephants can live in harmony and benefit from each other's existence. She has a master's degree in biology from the Miami University with dissertations on sustainable local solutions for human elephant conflicts in Thailand. She's currently conducting PhD research at the University of KwaZulu-Natal on integrated elephant conservation strategies in collaboration with Elephants Alive. Um, Antoinette is also director of the Elephant Specialist Advisory Group of South Africa and the most amazing person to work with. <laughs> Antoinette, please go ahead and present the findings from your paper. Uh, thank you so much, uh, David, and a big thank you to Future for Nature Academy and Miami University for providing this opportunity to present our work. And yeah, I'm, I'm here from South Africa. I'm at the moment not in Thailand anymore. And just would like to say that I'm super proud um, of David. It's very difficult uh, to leave Thailand where I've been working for, for so long and uh, bring the elephant home to Thailand couldn't be in better hands. Um, yeah, we have been working on this Behind Fence paper for over four years. So it's really exciting to have it published now. Um, as you can see, we have 11 authors on the paper. Um, uh, the study consisted of many sub-projects. Um, there was a social study, we looked at, uh, there was a camera trap study, citizen science. Um, so it was really great to have this big network uh, of organizations and also co-authors that were part of this. Uh, and a big thank you to Kevin and my supervisor at Miami University. Um, we have been talking about this project for so long and there, yeah, there were moments that I thought like, is it ever going to be published? Um, so yeah, really, really um, happy and really grateful for all the support. Um, yeah, and then it's really, I'm really grateful for the whole panel that we have here. Um, all these amazing elephant scientists um, from Africa and Asia, uh, people that are all super busy, uh, we have different time zones. Um, and it's just really amazing that everybody takes the time and that we are in this network together to learn from each other and share experiences. Um, just a little bit about how I got to know people. Um, when I started the project in, um, in Thailand, um, I reached out to a similar project in Sri Lanka. So I got in touch with, uh, with Kylie and Robin, who are both in the panel today, uh, to learn from their experience in Sri Lanka. Um, through Robin, I met uh, Dr. Michelle Henley of uh, Elephants Alive, who is also in this panel. And I actually met uh, Kun Rashaya, who just gave that amazing presentation of the BFN's project in Thailand through the Elephants and Bee um, Facebook group of Save the Elephants. Um, and yeah, Kun Rashaya always talks about the Beehive Fence project as a project, uh, as a model for friendship. And I think that's really true. And we also see this today, how nice it is, how we are all supporting each other and taking the time um, to discuss our model. And yeah, I also would like to express in the beginning of this presentation, um, so my supervisor for, one of my supervisors for my PhD now in South Africa, uh, Michelle Henley always uh, talks about how important, how, how much we can learn from uh, elephant societies, uh, societies that are led by women um, that really embrace coexistence. And if we look at the panel members now, we see some amazing matriarchs with a massive passion to create uh, coexistence in um, all these different areas in the world. Um, yeah, so through this event, we also got to know Dr. Prashi, who's doing amazing work in India. So he's also in the panel. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited uh, to discuss the model with uh, similar projects all over the world. And yeah, when I talk about, when I think about behind fences, I always think it's not just a barrier, it's more a method to connect and to empower. Uh, the fence model empowers farmers to take on solutions, develop solutions by themselves. And it connects people from around the world. It connects local people that are struggling to live with elephants with each other. And um, so I think today is also a moment uh, to celebrate that. Uh, so yeah, thank you for this great network and thank you for everybody who is watching from all over the world. Um, Lucy and 
And Rashida already gave an introduction about uh, beehive fences in Africa and Asia. We'd like to give a little bit of context of the situation in Asia and specifically Thailand. Um, so in the past, elephants used to roam around the continent, um, but at the moment there are about 50, there were less than 50,000 elephants left. Um, and in Thailand, we have about 3,500 elephants in the wild. Uh, and what is notable is that the majority is actually living in captivity. Uh, Thailand has 272 protected areas, that is about 20% of the land mass of the country. Um, but the problem is that it is quite fragmented, so the uh, national parks are not connected. And in most of these isolated patches of protected areas, uh, the populations are often smaller than the, the minimum viable uh, size of breeding individuals. Um, so elephants occur in 69 protected areas and human-elephant conflicts, whether it be crop damage, property damage, injuries or even death are reported to occur in about 41 protected areas. So two of our studies, the one that we did in uh, 2017, reported that about 50% of the people living at the border of a protected area in Western Thailand had experienced negative interaction with elephants. In the study that we are presenting now, that was even 81%. And so yeah, it's evident that uh, alleviation of human-elephant conflicts is one of the greatest elephant conservation challenges. A little bit about bringing elephant home. So we started in 2004 and in the beginning we were mostly focusing on um, the ecological system, uh, so protection of habitat, protection of elephants, uh, restoration of habitat, um, tree planting. Um, you could see ecological improvements, but if these projects are not really grounded in the local community, um, that's, yeah, that makes the sustainability, uh, the sustainability of those projects at risk. Um, so when we started to shift the focus more to the social system, so to the people that are actually living with elephants, you could see that change really started to happen. Um, people form an essential part of human-elephant conflict. So understanding the social dimensions of these problems are really essential to develop strat strategies that will be sustainable in the long term. Um, so through active engagement with local communities and by promoting access to benefits, for example, through our projects, um, we invited a lot of volunteers and so we developed a homestay program. People were planting trees, there were cultural activities. So people felt more um, included in conservation uh, projects. Uh, there was a possibility more to share their cultural value for elephants. Uh, so we noticed that people's attitudes uh, started to change, that they were becoming more tolerant towards elephants and yeah, to realize elephant management in a more holistic way and also that is more in line with international development goals. Um, it is essential to really look at the broader value of elephants and to look beyond just the borders of protected areas. Um, so to test our observations, um, it's um, a previous publication of human elephant conflicts in Western Thailand. Um, it showed that it was indeed um, that the people who gained benefit from elephants, they had a more positive attitude towards elephants. Um, and when we unpacked those benefits, it wasn't just financial benefits as what we might uh, thought at the beginning, but that uh, values like uh, community development, feelings like pride, uh, satisfaction, those were actually quite important drivers of uh, human elephant coexistence. Um, yeah, what we also found is that people that are depending on agriculture, so people that are really feeling the, the biggest impact of elephant damage, those were the people that were most negative about elephants. But what was interesting that still 80% of those people expressed their willingness to try beehive fencing. Um, so the start of the Be the Change research project, um, yeah, when we were through that questionnaire, we found out that people were interested in, um, in alternative methods to reduce uh, crop damage. Um, and then, um, yeah, I got in contact with, uh, with Kim Rashida. 
um, we were chatting about solutions and I was just so amazed that she was doing this whole project in, in Thailand and I saw one of her first videos of elephants appearing at the beehive fence and yeah we soon decided to organize a community workshop we brought the whole village from western thailand to her research station in in Lai. and it was a very inspiring trip for everybody and um yeah we just started talking about how can we how can we collaborate and how can we investigate how effective this method is in thailand um i visited the um, the Elephants and Bee uh, Research Center in Kenya and I met Lucy King for the first time and that immediately gave me feeling like this is a really great network um, to be to be part of. If, um, yeah, I was really hoping obviously to be part of, of this group and yeah it was just an amazing support from the start um, and she helped us a lot with how to set up the research design and how to connect us with um, with other people that were working with elephants and bees. Um, yeah, so we started to uh, develop our research. So the research objectives were twofold. So first was to evaluate the prevalence of human elephant conflicts and people's attitudes toward elephants in one of the human elephant conflict hotspots areas in Thailand by using uh, questionnaires. And the second objective was to test the effectiveness of a beehive fence uh, to deter Asian elephants on the farm by using camera traps and, uh, and interview data. Um, so a study site um, is in the eastern part of Thailand, in Jantaburi province. Um, you see at the, the blue uh, pointer, that's the, um, the site of the beehive fence. Uh, the area is surrounded by protected areas with uh, an increasing population of, of wild elephants. And that red um, area is the human elephant hotspots um, area. Um, the beehive fence is about 10 to 15 kilometers from the border of the protected area. And yeah, in 2012, uh, it was studied that there are about 70, 80 elephants living permanently in the area between the, in the agriculture areas uh, so outside of the protected areas. So how does that look like. I hope I can share the video for you. I'd study. So here you see the fence, the beer fence surrounding the farm. There are water tanks inside, there are mango, jackfruit, banana plants. Um, you see uh, there are people like growing cassava here. Uh, there are rubber trees here. There's a big uh, palm oil field over here. And in the background you see those protected areas where uh, this is Kao uh, Angrunai National Park, where about uh, between three and four hundred uh, elephants are living. And here you see such a big herd of elephants that are um, yeah, permanent, almost permanently outside of the protected area. So that's right outside um, the BI Fence Project. We go we zoom into the, um, the palm oil plantation it is a little bit further and um, you see that yeah this is a obviously a human dominated landscape it's um yeah, not like a protected uh asian rainforest obviously um but the landscape is quite diverse and what's an important thing is that there's a lot of water in these landscapes and especially in dry season there might be a lack of water in, in protected areas because there's so much agricultural development. So these elephants, um, the night, they often stay in a community forest. Uh, at daytime, they stay in community forest. At night time, they will roam through these plantations uh, to look for food and water. So to start um, investigating uh, the impact of elephants on local people, we conducted uh, about 300 community questionnaires in four villages in this area. Um, we first looked into human elephant conflicts. Uh, so about 80% of the participants stated that human elephant conflicts uh, are increasing in the area. 85% uh, of the people stated that they see or hear elephants um, at least once a week, about 51% daily. Uh, then the methods to deter elephants, 44% uh, uh, use lights, 36% use noise, 80% um, use fire, 
electric fences are used by 21% of the people. Um, other types of fencing, 6%, firecrackers are 6 uh, gunshots, 3%, or chasing elephants with vehicles, or 2%. Um, here are two examples of uh, local developed uh, elephant mitigation uh, methods. As on the left is a firecracker and on the right is a bottle fence just to make a noise when, uh, when elephants appear. 81% um, of the people has experienced a negative impact from elephants in the last five years. So this can be crop damage, injuries, um, and also fear or stress. And 91% of these people that are living in this beautiful area with, with such magnificent elephant sightings, um, but they don't perceive any benefits from, from living with elephants. Uh, so because of that situation, um, only a small percentage, 70% uh, is able to continue their current farming practices. And so 40% uh, is considering to change the crop that elephants don't like. 60% uh, need to find better methods to deter elephants and 10% is thinking about selling their farm. Um, because of that, people don't find it important to investigate in elephant conservation, 66%. Um, but despite that, um, the majority of people uh, still uh, doesn't support a local um, eradication of elephants, but prefer rather uh, conditionally to tolerance towards elephants. So they would prefer to have elephants if the damage could be uh, mitigated. So then we move to the, the start of the Beehive Fence project. Uh, so uh, Rashaya and the Pulawang Wildlife Research Team uh, had been working hard by providing workshops and training um, to the farmers that were used to work on agricultural land, were trained to become beekeepers and uh, a beehive fence was installed um, around a uh, 0.4 hectare plot. Uh, yeah, 40 beehives were uh, surrounding the farm, so using a 250 meter uh, bamboo, uh, bamboo fence. The beehives uh, are connected to ropes and when elephants try to enter the, um, the property, the beehives start to swing. Uh, this causes the, the bees to, uh, to make a noise and come out and uh, deter the elephants. Um, so some adjustments from the, the Beehive Fence Manual that has been uh, developed by Lucy King. Um, so other than Africa and to adjust to the smaller Asian elephants, we reduce the distance between the, the beehives. Um, some places six meter, but where, where we know that elephants are breaking through or what's like really on their uh, route, uh, it can even be less. And we didn't use dummy hives like uh, what Russia already um, explained. And we used the uh, Apis mellifera bee species, so the Italian bee species that has been used for about uh, 70 years in Thailand um, and is a preferred bee species because of a higher honey production and they, has a, they have a less tendency to swarm, so they will stick to the hive, even if there's some disturbance. Um, but still, both the, the native Asian bees and the, the Italian bees um, are not as aggressive as the African bee species, and that's the biggest challenge to make this method successful uh, in Asia. Uh, the Pulawang team developed a trigger mechanism, and uh, you see it here on the, the picture. Uh, so when the elephant pushes the um, the ropes, it opens the hive. Um, Cooperating normally occur occurs during nights when the bees are normally inactive, but by opening the hive that uh, activates the bees and increases the effectiveness of um, the beehive fence. Uh, so along the beehive fence, we installed uh, camera traps. Um, uh, we had yeah, 12 camera traps installed and using camera traps is a suitable technique because we can capture uh, fence breaks but we can also observe the behavior of the elephants uh, as a reaction to the, the bees. Uh, and we could identify group size, sex, and um, other factors that might influence uh, the likelihood of fence breaking. Um, so we captured videos for 17 months. And um, after cleaning the data, we had 108 video clips of elephants interacting with the beehive fence. Um, that was a lot of data and I don't know how many times I went through all these videos and yeah, it was just 
very difficult to do that with a small group. And um, I gave a lecture through the Future for Nature Academy. Um, yeah, I presented the first results and discussed it with a few people. Like it's still quite difficult to really you know, be sure about uh, what this all meant. And they suggested to start a citizen science project. Uh, so we collaborated on an international citizen science project and we used the platform Zooniverse. So we uploaded all the videos to the Zooniverse platform and then uh, Future for Nature Academy hosted two events at Utrecht and Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And together we recruited 44 uh, citizen scientists. Uh, we developed uh, a field guide and a tutorial And uh, together with this team from all over the world, um, they classified, they classified uh, more than 800, um, uh, well, they contributed at 800 classifications. So each video was uh, about eight, at about, at about eight classifications. So in Zooniverse, uh, people uh, would classify the number of elephants that appear in the video whether or not the elephants cross the fence, their level of confidence of the classifier, and the behavior that they could observe uh, that could indicate a level of attentiveness or alarm. Uh, for example, elephants closing their eyes, spreading the ears, or having their tail in the air, uh, a slow retreat. So this is the first video of, um, of, my, of our research project. Um, it was also quite a Uh, disappointing <laughs> to see this um, but yeah we see eight uh, six elephants going through the fence um, but you can see like the tail is in the air they're um, yeah quite quite stressed um, you see them fleeing out of the, the property as so they were inside and then moving outside um, and then yeah we at that time we still had quite a um, a, a big distance between the hives. The trigger mechanism wasn't installed yet and the bee population per hive was also still growing. So it, it really takes time to really uh, develop a strong population and to make sure that uh, the deterrence effect is, um, is effective enough. So this is two months uh, later. We see the bull approaching the, um, the bee hive fence during uh, quite a dark night. And you see him um, interrupting the activities. But it's highly likely that if the fence wasn't there, that he would enter the, the property. You see him inspecting and spreading the ears, investigating what is going on, um, ear flapping. He's trying to consider the options. Um, and in the end, um, you see that he slowly retreats. Another video. Uh, this is almost a full moon night. You see the same thing. The elephant is uh, spreading the ears, listening, observing. We had a lot of videos that elephants were pushing the fence and trying to see what happens. You see the elephants you know, getting close to the fence and uh, slowly retreating. Well, we had over 100 videos um, like this. And yeah, so in total, we observed. 155 elephants, and of those 155 individual elephants, we had 18 elephants crossing the fence. So for the individual elephants, this is about 88% effective. And if we look in terms of the elephant groups, there were 28 elephant groups identified, and of those groups, 10 crossed the fence. So that's 64% effective. Um, so on average, we had per video clip, it was uh, a range from between one to maximum six elephants per video. But if we look per event, so if we would combine the individual video clips per event, uh, there was a range for up to 37 elephants that we could observe through the camera trap videos. Um, what is interesting is that we uh, observed more female elephants. Um, and yeah, we were very interested to look into the effect of, for example, elephant group size, uh, whether or not uh, male elephant groups were more likely to break the fence, and if moonlight had an effect on fence breaking behavior. Um, so we looked into that, and yeah, we compared this to other, sto other studies. Um, we observed a more equal distribution of um, all male groups, mixed sex groups, and solo females. 
and we didn't observe any effects of group size on the groups or moon on the likeliness of breaking through a fence. Um, what was very useful um, for observing the behavior of elephants and for this the citizen science project was such a support because there's so many little details that you can uh, observe in elephant behavior. Um, so it was a big database and we were watching the videos over and over again. Uh, but yeah, we concluded that about 70% of the elephants um, expressed some sort of attentive or alarm behavior. So if we look into that, for example, the reaching out to the fence was observed uh, many times. So it's like investigating uh, what's going on, uh, slowing, slowly retreating or fleeing uh, from, from a threat. So that's obviously a clear response to the beehive fence. Um, as bee stings are especially painful for elephants, like in the, the tip of the trunk or in the eyes or the ears, we specifically looked for uh, behavior that would um, indicate attentiveness to that. And indeed, we found that elephants were closing their eyes when they approached the fence or putting the trunk in their mouth or flapping the ears. Um, in contrast to studies in Africa, uh, only 1% of the elephants showed head shaking behavior. Uh, so that's a difference in uh, response between African and Asian elephants. Uh, we checked if elephants would habituate to the beehive fence, even though this was this a 17 month study. Um, but this table shows the, the start of the, the project, so that was the 1st of August. Um, and then the number of days that the fence has been um, implemented. And we saw that, uh, so this is the effectiveness, so here we see like 100% effective. And over time, um, we saw, we did a regression analysis and we showed that the deterrence rate remained uh, constant. And so the camera trap data was, uh, was quite positive, but yeah, the most important um, aspect is obviously what is the perception of the owner? If they are not positive about it, then um, there's no need to celebrate the success yet. Um, yeah, we first we did two interviews, one right after the study and one um, two years later, I think, when we were getting ready to publish the results to make sure that um, the attitudes didn't change or uh, yeah, just to verify what we captured before, if it was still correct. Um, so we first talked about what were the challenges of the offenses uh, and she expressed that especially felt like she was not fully prepared for the amount of work that beekeeping requires. Um, and also that not being prepared with all the visitors this project uh, attracted because it was all over the time media. We had volunteer groups, film groups. Um, so from a livelihood of just working on the farmland, we suddenly became this ambassador of this whole project and getting involved with using camera traps and but it was, yeah, it's quite intimidating at uh, start. Another big challenge was uh, damage from bee eater birds. Um, yeah, uh, the bees attract birds, so that, uh, that could severely uh, cause damage to the bee population. So it's very important to yeah, find good mitigation uh, measures for that. Um, another challenge is that the use of chemicals, so the, the bee fence owners obviously have to stop using chemicals on the land because it affects the bees, but sometimes neighbor farms would, would still use it. And um, um, yeah, so there needs to be an agreement with, with neighbors and hopefully more neighbors would like to keep bees as well and uh, stop using pesticides on the land. A uh, social issue, what we have to be very mindful about is that there could be jealousy if one farmer gets a lot of support um, yeah, what about the neighbors? We need to be careful that we don't affect social cohesion in the villages. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's important if, uh, if people really own the Beehive Fence project, that it's their own honey production, uh, their, own, yeah, their, their own responsibility to manage it, and that more people will have access maybe through a micro loan system or things like that, that it's uh, accessible for more farmers. Then the benefits, so after see um, she, um, yeah, she learned to understand the bees better. Um, she said that she preferred beekeeping compared to agricultural work. Um, and yeah, according to her, she perceives the beehive fence as a very effective method. Sorry, I didn't quite hear you. 
<laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, it's a very effective method to deter elephants. Uh, before the beehive fence was installed, she said that human elephant conflicts were occurring almost every night. And after the beehive fence, it was only once or twice per month. Uh, and then the benefits from the sales of honey and raising bee queens and beehives that was quite substantial. Uh, through the duration of the study, uh, she had a harvest of 250 kilograms of honey. And then there were additional scales of pride and skill development, uh, different benefits. The pride, skill development, and the monetary benefits from hosting all these visitors. Um, yeah, and because they had to stop using pesticides, she felt that she was more connected with nature, working with the bees. Uh, and she experienced feelings of well-being by helping other people in human elephant conflict areas and by being able uh, to care for her family. Um, so if we look at the effectiveness of, of beehive fences, um, we often immediately hear that percentage of how effective it is, is it 60% or, um, but yeah, in, in our idea, these additional benefits are, are much more important. Uh, through the project, uh, people develop new skills, it really contributes to human well-being, uh, which affects their tolerance towards elephants. It provides more equality, it contributes to sustainable communities, and through the use of bees and uh, this living in harmony philosophy, it contributes to life on land. And um, what is also clear from this uh, presentation, uh, this webinar today, is that this partnership is really important uh, for different organizations working on human elephant conflicts, but definitely also for people that are living with elephants. So in summary, both the questionnaire and uh, the interviews confirmed that human elephant conflicts are widespread and increasing in this region. And it highlighted the need for uh, more sustainable and integrated solutions that not only reduce damage from elephants, but also increase their val the value of elephants for local people. Um, well, about 64% of elephant groups and 88% of individual elephants were effectively de deterred in this case. Um, the owner reported reduction in damage, but also ad additional benefits. And it's an empowering method that provides opportunities for education, strengthening awareness and cooperation. And so why the offenses are not the solution? Um, there's a limitation in our study. Uh, it was only 17 months. Uh, it was just one farm with uh, a very dedicated beekeeper that was it's not always uh, feasible in other areas. Uh, we didn't have a control plot because it was established a control plot in the beginning, but it was very difficult uh, to refrain people from using other mitigation methods. But in the end, we decided to use the interview data. Um, it requires substantial financial resources, labor. Um, it required problem solving skills. Uh, fences need to encircle an entire farm that might not be feasible on larger farms. And the fencing only cures the symptom and not the cause. And it's evident that the offenses is not a standalone uh, solution. So these integrated strategies that uh, combine and rotate different measures and um, living in harmony philosophy is what's really needed. Um, this is just uh, preparation for our next project, like what are the drivers of conflicts to es escalate? And it has to do with habitat degradation and a lack of collaboration. People depending on monocrops and a lack of benefits or depending on a single support system. So there are a lot of different connections uh, that can lead to human elephant conflicts. And if we connect the natural and the social goals, and if we combine all these different methods, it's contributing to elephants that are thriving and people that are thriving that will hopefully result in human elephant coexistence. Uh, just a short note about our next project that is uh, inspired by this whole model is the Tom, Tom Yum project. Uh, Tom Yum is the healthy Thai soup of which all the ingredients are unpalatable unpal for elephants. So by planting these crops, we diversifying uh, livelihoods. We again um, reducing the use of pesticides, looking for permaculture and methods. Um, it's not just food production, but we try to create this range of alternative uh, products that we can sell to support people living in harmony with elephants. The first sites have just been planted last week and this picture was actually last night, the first elephants visiting our site and so far didn't cause any damage yet. 
And yeah, uh, so this was the presentation about our Be The Change project. Uh, we're really excited about moving forward, uh, combining the Tom Young project with uh, Be The Change and using bees in this uh, system as well, and perhaps looking at spicy beehive fences. And for this, uh, we found there's a, a big, we again try to establish a collaboration in Thailand to setting up collaboration again with the Pulawang Wildlife Research Station, but also Human Elephant Forces. Colleagues in Sri Lanka, we are looking at uh, setting up research in, in two different countries with, with uh, drunken leaves. And with Dr. Eva Gross, we're looking at uh, yeah, what are the best ways to test these different crops. And then a big thank you to the sponsors um, of our projects. That's the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund of IUCN, INO of uh, WW of Netherlands and Fondation Ensemble in France, uh, also supporting the Beehive Friends project. And of course, all our partners, citizen science, volunteers, and donors of Bring the Elephant Home. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Antoinette. That's amazing. And um, so incredible to see, like you mentioned at the start, so many years of beehive fence trials. And yeah, I can only imagine how many times you've reviewed those camera trap footages, those videos. Um, so yeah, thank you for that and for mentioning the, the, the Tom Yum project as well, which we're excited to share with everybody. Um, so in order to keep going, we're going to start our, our panel now. Um, we've had so many amazing questions come in, and so it would be great to leave a lot of time for that. So I'm going to do quick introductions um, for our experts, maybe one by one. And after I introduce, maybe you can take a few minutes just to talk about your experiences with Beehive Fences and um, anything you want to add to the discussion on the model. Um, and then we'll open it up to some questions. So if everyone's all right, I'm going to introduce our first um, panelist. Uh, her name is Dr. Pachi Mehta from India, and she's a senior scientist with the Wildlife Research and Conservation Society India. Dr. Mehta and her team have been implementing a program called Community-Based Crop Protection from Elephants in the North Kanara district of Karnataka in Southern India. Amongst other methods, they're also training farmers in installing beehives. Um, and hopefully we can hear a little bit more about that from you, Dr. Mehta. Um, Why don't you go ahead and share experiences from India? Can you hear me? Thank you, David. Uh, yep, I'm we really... can hear you already. Okay, so I'm, I must say I'm really honored to be here uh, with you guys and you know, all my experts and my old friend, Lucy. So let me let me tell you how we started on with this. It's a very interesting uh, uh, story. I met Lucy in 2009, right, at in at Beijing, in, in China, on one of the IUC and conferences. And she very enthusiastically came and told me, "Prachi, you must try this. You know, you can imagine Lucy with her enthusiasm and with her uh, bees, and, and you know, it's uh, so she said." You know, this is what we are trying, and I think you should try this back in India. I was a little uh, skeptical, bees and elephants, you know, like the smallest and the biggest, largest. But I believed her, and we, I just got the sound from her, uh, the Epis mellifera sound, and I tried it in our, our field site. And this is my own experience when they were tuskers. You know, the Tuskers are all, this is, these are, uh, this is in Karnataka, in southern India, where I'm working. And these are all paddy fields, you know, rice, rice fields. So uh, the, the elephants were right there, feeding on the rice crop, and we broadcasted the call of the bees, which uh, Lucy had given me. And the Tuskers immediately, there were two of them, and they had raised trunks and their ears flapped. It was about 50 meters distant. They, they heard the sound and immediately they retreated. And you wouldn't believe the farmers were jubilant. We were surprised. And that, that's how our story began. And then this experiment started. We started working with this uh, sound call first. And uh, for a year or two, we got very good success. And the farmers were asking for the, you know, the call all the time. That we want the recording so that you know we could do use this, and then as uh, Lucy had suggested, that we actually try out with the beehive fences, and we started with the beehive fences. Uh, 
uh, we tried with the KTBH the way she, uh, Lucy had told us to, and then later on uh, we have now shifted to log hives to keep the cost of the fences low because otherwise you know in this and this area experiences very high rainfall. So we have an extremely dedicated team in the field. Uh, Ravi Yalapur is already in the audience, and Amir Khan, and we have an excellent field team. So they they have been going convincing the farmers, and we are putting up the log high fences, and that has actually uh, benefited uh, um, most of our farmers. Like we have put them in the entry point, so we have enclaves, uh, you know, where we have. Elephants coming, and there they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, a proper uh, uh, point where the elephants will enter. That's where we have put up the fences. I'm very uh, happy to let you know that the elephants have stopped coming from there. So, for whatever reason, now see, we haven't uh, uh, deployed camera traps. We will be doing it now, uh, but the elephants have kept away from these elephant areas. And the farmers have been nicely harvesting honey, and uh, they have been earning an handsome income, income of about say three hundred dollars, which is a very good sum for them. So as 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 of now, we have about a uh, hundred beehives, uh, beehive fences ready, and uh, as the season progresses, we'll have more. So I'm looking forward to it, and I think thanks to you guys and to Lucy. Who inspired us with her pioneering work and her team? So this is this is our story from India. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Mehta. That's amazing and such an inspiring story. Um, I was really amazed to. I'll post the link in the chat, but to a, an article written in the Guardian um, last month that profiled the success story about um, the Beehive Fence Project in India on World Elephant Day. So congratulations and thank you for sharing. Um, I'll go on and introduce our next panelist. Um, from Elephants Alive, we have two representatives. First is Dr. Michelle Henley, um, who has a PhD in elephant ecology and has studied elephants for 25 years. She has published numerous scientific papers and book chapters as well, uh, in book chapters as well as in popular press. She's the CEO, co-founder, and principal researcher at Elephants Alive, a director of the Elephants Specialist Advisory Group of South Africa, Elephants for Africa and an invited member of the African Elephant Specialist Group of the IUCN. Dr. Michelle Henley is also a qualified teacher. She's passionate about conservation and has received a number of conservation awards. And on top of all of those really inspiring roles, she also expresses her passion for elephants in her art. Amazing she has time for it. That's incredible. <laughs> um, also with Dr. Michelle Henley is Robin Cook, who is the Big Tree Projects Manager at Elephants Alive in South Africa where his research focuses on the dynamics surrounding elephant impact on big tree species across the greater Kruger National Park. Robin has co-authored and co-authored numerous scientific and popular articles related to elephant bee research and is currently pursuing a PhD in elephant ecology through the University of Witwatersand in Johannesburg. Welcome Dr. Michelle Henley and Robin Cook. Why don't you join us and share a little bit about your experiences with the Beehive Fence Model? Thank you. It's so lovely to be sharing this afternoon with you. Um, I'll just give a really brief background on, on the different way in which we've started using bees um, in South Africa. So in 2004, we started, uh, started monitoring the impact of elephants on large trees because in South Africa, our reserves are mostly fenced. And the big conservation concern is the impact that elephants are having on large trees. Um, and, uh, and it's a real burning concern. I mean, that was one of the reasons why elephants were culled in South Africa. Um, people were of the opinion that you can protect large trees by killing elephants. Um, and then in 2015, I collaborated with Dr. Lucy King and we decided to test whether we can use bees to protect large trees. And we got a really shining student, Robin Cook, um, who spearheaded that study for his master's degree. And I'm going to leave you, I'm going to leave Robin to tell you a, a bit about the detail of what we found and, and the results that we've got, which is really promising. Um, but it's very exciting to know that, you know, we started out in these 
um, these enclosed reserves in South Africa to try and foster peaceful coexistence with people because it was a mild form of conflict, how um, people were worried about large trees being destroyed by elephants. But now we've also taken the project outside of the protected areas and we're very excited to be working with Lucy in Mozambique. Um, where we've, where we've got elephants that we've collared and we can see where they've created corridors. And now we need to get people to buy into the fact that these elephants are, are walking through their land and potentially damaging their crops. So the model that we've chosen is to empower women and we're very blessed where we're based. We work with the, all um, the Black Mamba anti-poaching units. So these are women that are already protecting wildlife in the protected areas in South Africa. And we're gonna use bees outside of the protected areas to upskill these women and to give them um, various skills and, and let them spread the message and use them as ambassadors for when we go into Mozambique. So the South African project is becoming a proof of concept for what we're actually trying in Mozambique, where we want to teach people to live in harmony with elephants, but particularly in elephant corridor, corridors. So I'm gonna let Robin tell you about the wonderful results that he found um, since he started studying um, the interaction between elephants, big trees, and bees in, from 2015. Thanks, Michelle, and hi there to everyone. And just to say what an honor it is to be on this panel with all of you. Some of you I've met, some of you I would love to meet in the future. And just to let you know about our project here in the Greater Kruger National Park. So it's quite different to the farm setup where, as Michelle says, it's a worry over big trees being pushed down from elephants. And so we're looking at the marula tree species here, which is a keystone species and has economic, ecological, and cultural significance. And so what we do is hang beehives in the tree itself. So they hung from the primary branches of a tree and they are about two meters above the ground. And so it's at that sort of eye height level when an elephant's going to come and impact a tree, it's going to bump into a beehive in the process. And so this study has been running for almost five years now. In November, we celebrate our five year anniversary. And so we're now starting to see the long-term data coming out of the study. And what we've found is after the four-year study in November last year of our control trees, so these are trees that have no, uh, no beehives in them, 82% of them have been impacted since the study begun, of which 22% of those trees are dead. Now looking at the beehive site, 10% have been impacted since the study begun, of which 4% of them are dead. So in this area we're working in, we've had the marula trees are declining at about 8.8% 8 .8, 8 .8 of their population per year, and beehives in that site have brought it down to 1.2%. So it's very exciting for us to see that we are now giving landowners or reserve managers a new tool that they can use to protect certain iconic tree species across the area. And we've then introduced honey production as well. So a landowner can protect their trees and also look into um, natural bush felt honey from the Kruger National Park um, as well. And then we've also collaborated, we were very honored to collaborate with Professor Mark Wright from the University of Hawaii and Dr. Agnor Mafranito from ISCA Technologies and Craig Spencer from Transfrontier Africa. And they've taken this another step further and looked at bee pheromones. So the actual attack pheromones that bees give off when they are disturbed. And so us as beekeepers, if you disturb a beehive, you know the smell straight away. So they synthetically produced it, and we then tested it at water holes here in the Kruger National Park region. And what we found is sites, especially close to where our actual beehive site is, we were able to deter elephants up to 82% from going to a water hole. So they get to that smelling substance and they stop and they would go right around to the other side and drink there. They were not happy, but it was a very uh, how would you describe it? It's, it's not an aggressive response, which is exactly what we're looking for. It's a mild response. And so they're just not happy. They move away because as Mark rightly puts it, you don't want six tons of angry beasts running through the bush because they smelt something they don't like. So it's very exciting that we're able to take part in these initiatives and see how bee biology can be used. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. And that's a really yeah, a really interesting way to assess um, the different ways that fences are used, because obviously, as 
uh, Kunrache mentioned that um, the hives were used to protect somebody's home or farmland, but hearing the way that they're used to protect trees or protect different, yeah, different aspects of the environment is equally important. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker, uh, who's going to tell us a little bit about beehive fences and the trials in Sri Lanka. So, uh, Kylie Butler has studied both Asian and African elephants in several range countries throughout her career. She was a Master of Environment and Research Intern with Save the Elephants in Kenya before conducting her Master of Philosophy research in Sri Lanka, the University of Newcastle's School of Environmental and Life Sciences. Um, the link to her complete master thesis, Behavior and Cooperating Patterns of Asian Elephants, Can Beehive help, Fences Help Mitigate Human-Elephant Conflict in Sri Lanka, um, will be posted in the chat here. So, Kylie Butler, if you can go ahead and share a little bit about your experiences from Sri Lanka, and I'll go ahead and share your, uh, your research with everybody. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, hello to everyone, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, so I, I'll just talk very briefly about the project in Sri Lanka. Um, I, as David mentioned, I worked on that project as part of my Master's of Philosophy uh, with Lucy King from Save the Elephants and also Robin Cook came in as one of our project leaders when I was back in Melbourne writing up. So we had a four year study. Uh, the first year was more getting to know the communities and developing the project site and then three years with the Beehive Fences. Um, relatively small project, a uh, little community heavily affected by human elephant conflict. We had 10 fences and we surrounded home gardens. That was an area that people identified as needing protection from elephants. And it was simpler for the very first trial um, than trying to protect fields, which were often interconnected with their neighbors. Um, we had some quite encouraging results from the project. Um, there was significantly less elephant entries into the um, homes that were protected by the beehive fences and this deterrent effect seemed to increase with hive occupations. Um, but there were also a number of challenges at the site and the main one for us, probably the two main challenges for us were um, the bees themselves. So beekeeping was quite difficult in the area. We had a lot of bees absconding um, and we really struggled with natural hive occupations. So we ended up needing to source a lot of bees from Colombo or Candy and this added a considerable expense to the beehive fences. Um, and the other main challenge was farmer motivation, which really fluctuated. Um, obviously everyone was very keen at the beginning and um, when we had a lot of abscondments and hives were more empty, we found people took a lot less care of their fences. So that was something that really varied over time. Um, so yeah, that, that's a little summary of it and happy to answer any questions later if anyone has any. Fantastic, thank you so much and congratulations on uh, yeah, su submitting the, the, the thesis. It was amazing to read and learn about, thank you so much. Um, so now that we've introduced and heard a little bit from all of our panelists and experts, we're going to open it up to a question and answer portion. So we've had some amazing questions so far um, put into the Zoom webinar, but if you have any others, please do send uh, send now. Juan, I wonder if you want to start us off with, um, I think there were a few questions that were asked multiple times. Do you have any questions that might be great to start us off? Yes, indeed. We had almost 50 questions over the webinar uh, through YouTube, through Facebook here as well. So thanks everyone for the, for the interaction. And uh, one that pops up quite often is how do you deal with elephants getting habituated to, to the beehives and to the bees. So how do you deal with, with elephants being so smart and, and keeping up with the, with the bees? Maybe for this, just, yeah, please, anybody on the, any, any of our experts joining us, please just jump in and share your experiences because yeah, from African and Asian range countries will have quite a variety of answers, so. Please go ahead. So maybe, maybe I could say a little bit about that. Um, I think really the, the key reason why this does work is that elephants don't habituate to being stung by bees. It is particularly painful and um, unbelievably they can be stung through their skin. It's uh, probably not through the thick body of their skin, but it's around the watery area. 
you know, maybe on the thin skin of the ears. Um, and these African bees release a pheromone when they do sting that, that Robin discussed and um, the other bees come and swarm the same site. So, you know, it's not really one bee sting that these elephants are scared of, it's many hundreds of stings. Um, and these elephants, as you know, they never forget. So they only need to be stung a few times for them to remember that that smell and that sound is very negative and they don't want to be stung and they don't want their calves to be stung. So it creates this really perfect circle of negative conditioning. Um, and this is what is different about the beehive fence, which is a kind of live active fence. It's, it's very different to a kind of more static um, scare factor that might be a, a jolt or a sound that they worry about, but this actually does hurt. Um, but I think it, it hurts ethically. This is a natural interaction between two species. It's not a human, inf human um, influenced pain. So we feel comfortable about that pain level. Um, and as far as we can tell, they only really get stung once or twice and they never come back. So we're, we're relying very much on that, um, not being habituated to this particular pain. Yeah, thanks for that, Dr. Lucy King. We, we actually just like jumping in on that and building off of that from here in Thailand, um, people have a very strong cultural attachment to elephants and they feel quite negatively about, about these negative human induced deterrents. And so people respond quite positively to the beehive fence because they like that the beehive fence can stand there and their human elephant relationship doesn't have to suffer, that they don't have to be in conflict, that these are sort of on the front lines doing it for them. So yeah, we experience that here in Thailand as well. Um, does anybody else wanna discuss their experiences with hab habituation before we carry on to the next question? If not, Juan, go ahead and throw another one our way. <laughs> well, a bit in relation with this one, uh, it's about the differences of the species of bees used in Africa or in Asia, because apparently the African bees are really aggressive and they can be uh, yeah, really uh, harm for the elephants, while Asian bees are more mild. And there was also a girl from Sumatra saying that the, the Sumatra bees are really like pets, so you can even touch them and nothing happens. So uh, yeah, which are your differences and how do you choose the, the bee species for each of the places? Should I go ahead? Can I go ahead? Please go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so um, you know, when uh, we observe the bees, uh, we actually, when we were playing the uh, sound of the bees and we were observing the elephants from far, what we observed is the elephants started shaking their heads and the trunk and uh, you know, started moving it towards their eyes. So trying to prevent any bee entering in their eyes or their ears, so they were flapping that. So whether it's a very aggressive bee or not, it is a bee after all for an elephant. So the sound itself, you know, or the fear of the, uh, the bee getting into the ears or the trunk or the eyes, it keeps the elephant on their alert. And I think that is what works for the uh, bee fencing, even if it's in Africa or Asia. This is what I understand from our study and uh, whatever I've observed from the other. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Pachimeta. I mean, the, the the fact that, like you mentioned, it's um, it's an elephant and a bee. I think that that's a very good way to describe it, just as you did. I mean, um, choosing the bee species. Does does anybody else? I know a few of our panelists have experience in working with several species of bees um, in different Asian and African landscapes. Do you have any? I can almost um, feel Dr. Lucy King itching to jump in. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel you from here or across continents, but please do. <laughs> I think I think quite a few of us Robin certainly works with both and been stung by both. <laughs> I think Antoinette has as well. So um, yeah, they, they are they are very different bee species. I think on this panel we've worked with Apis mellifera scutellata, Apis mellifera mellifera, and Apis um, serrana indica. So the Indian, the, the in Italian, the, the European bee, the African bee. So there's all sorts of um, bees being tested. They they all do have slight differences. Um, here, you know, in Africa, they really are very aggressive, very, very protective of their honey stores. And it's mostly because of the extreme dry seasons where they lose their honey. So they are so protective of that last vital storage unit. Um, and we see the bees are slightly less aggressive where there's a lot of flower resources and a lot of natural water. Um, so it's often, you know, area specific as well. 
and again there is no there is no um standard situation across all our sites and even within kenya we have aggressive areas of bees and less aggressive so i think it's you know every every site if you want to try this in your study site you have to find your, you have to really do your own experiment you know what are your bees behaving like in your area how do your elephants respond to that are your elephants even aware of bees in your study area so um, i'd encourage everyone to do their own research if you want to think of this could work in your area um, and we'd love to help you if you want to do your own study. We're all still learning on this. Um, if I could just add to that here in our study site where we've got all our bees in one particular area, we even notice personality differences amongst the hives, um, quite often related to the queen herself. And so you get some hives which are quite easy to walk through or walk past and they're the ones I normally would take a guest to, for example, and others which are complete nightmares and on most occasions end up chasing us away. And so that's been very interesting just within our own study site, same species, same area, how you get some really aggressive hives and some really, what I call sweethearts. Uh, they just really are quite nice to be around. I don't know how good they are then at protecting their tree, but they're wonderful for us to then get closer to. And then as Lucy said, going to Sri Lanka, I remember the first time Sapun, who was the, um, the, uh, the assistant on the ground there, opened up a hive and we weren't wearing suits or anything and I ran and I said what are you doing because I was so used to the African situation and he showed me how you could work with the Asian bees and there was for me day one I clicked just how different those two species are with one another. Um, can I add something to that? <laughs> yeah um, yeah I think it, it's very clear that uh, that it's much more challenging to make this method successful in Asia because the yeah the bee species available there um, are just much less aggressive. Um, yeah, our BI French project decided to go for the Italian bee species, and it might also not be feasible in every area. It was through Miami University. It was a yeah a big ethical clearance, and to go to that whole process like can you bring that bee species to that area? Um, yeah, and yeah, because the bees have been used for such a long time and are really um, quite common and widespread in, in those regions. Um, but yeah, that makes a difference already if you compare it to the, the native species. But it might not be possible in every area. And then, yeah, also the Pulawan Wildlife Research Station and also the beekeepers were really engaged in making those bee populations thriving. Um, it was it's quite a large area. They were planting a lot of flowers and yeah, really taking good care that the bee populations could grow. Um, so it doesn't mean um, yeah, by establishing a fence that it will immediately be a similar result. It's, it requires a lot of adaptation and learning and getting to know the bees and the environment. Um, yeah, so that's also a very interesting learning experience of adapting and improving. I'll jump in as well, um, just to give the context of bees, you know, there's, there's 20,000 species of bee in the world. And so uh, often when they talk about bees and certainly honeybees, they're just talking about a few species um, that are mostly native to Eurasia. So it is definitely important to consider, um, are the honeybees native in the region you're trying to introduce them? Or if they're not native, have they been naturalized, like is the case in Thailand? Um, where the Italian honeybees have been used for quite some time and therefore any sort of, you know, competition that could be happening with, with the uh, native species of bees um, would presumably be uh, less. But I think overall it's interesting to be, and, and a lot of bee biologists are starting to look at this because people are very concerned about honeybees declining due to colony collapse disorder and other things. Um, so they want to promote honeybees and certainly they pr produce honey and we love that. But we also need to think about the native wild bees um, and what that's doing for their populations. So there's quite a, quite a number of things. This will lead you down a bit of a rabbit hole <laughs> of research, um, but there's a lot to be studied in regards to this. So. Thanks so much for that, Kevin. Kevin is also, yeah, I think we had a, a lecture, an hour, an hour plus long lecture on bees, specifically from Kevin. So if you want more of that, please do. <laughs> please do seek out Kevin's expertise on bees between species. Um, so I wonder, Juan, do we have any, maybe let's take one more, one more question. 
one or two, depending. <laughs> Let's take one more. And I think this is also different in different places, but uh, the best of the beehive fences is that you involve the local communities. And people are very curious about regarding the, the involvement of the local communities, which kind of activities can you implement? And probably this differs between Africa and Asia. So if anyone wants to start from the different places, please go ahead. So let's start from Thailand. <laughs> Yeah, so we've been working on different uh, community-based projects for, for quite some time. And uh, we started with a, a, our biggest project at that time as a reforestation project. Uh, so by organizing this tree planting event, um, people were growing seedlings, selling seedlings, and then doing tree planting events, we got volunteers. They developed a homestay project, uh, providing food, a cultural dance, massage, all this kind of spin-off uh, developments came just from that initial uh, tree planting initiative um, and yeah with the beehive fences it's also amazing what comes out of it because people just want to visit the area and um, we often have it that people don't just come to see wild elephants they want to see the beehive fence in action <laughs> and they want to do a honey tasting and they want to learn how this works and maybe see a camera trip video so people get visitors and from that they also start a kind of ecotourism um, development and people can sell additional products. They have the honey products, but also like local crafts. Um, so yeah, I always feel like once it is starting, there's a lot that can grow from there that can, people can benefit in different ways. Does anybody else want to comment on the yeah, the, the difference in, in cultures, you know? That summed it up pretty well, internet. Juan, maybe one more question, let's do it. Because we've got to wrap things up. <laughs> I know somebody was asking about, um, one of the very common questions was using the sound of these and the pheromones of these uh, to deter elephants. And I know that, uh, Robin, you mentioned that a little bit in the pheromone testing. Um, and studies have been done on using the sound of bees to, to deter elephants as well. Does anybody want to address that from their personal experiences, pheromones and, and sound replay, replay? Sure, yes. Um, we, so the, we actually started out this research just based on the sound uh, deterrent to try and understand the behavioral reactions. Um, we are actually testing a system of buzz box uh, We've been designed by an organization called Wild Survivors who've used our bee sound and we're going to be testing this out. So I, I still think beehive fences are the ultimate solution really because they provide all these other benefits. But there are circumstances where the, um, the use of bee sounds could be very useful for places where you don't really want beehives um, like schools or water tanks or perhaps hotels where it's not necessarily appropriate to have live bees. But also we're going to be using them as we build beehive fences and you know we're building hundreds of these now um, in many farms it takes time for the bees to come they're all um, well certainly on our project they come naturally they're natural swarms we don't um, make bees in Africa we can't post them through the box like you do in America um, so we're waiting for wild swarms and the beehives are empty for a few weeks or a few months so we're going to be using buzz boxes as an intermediary to help keep the elephants away from empty beehives while we wait for the natural swarms to come in. We often build our beehive fences in the dry season because the farmers aren't as busy, um, but it isn't always the best season to get the bees. So we build them in the dry season, wait for the rains to come. And then in the meantime, we have to make sure the elephants stay away. So I think there's, like everything, there's always um, a use for these uh, intermediary to, uh, methods to keep elephants out, but rotating them, not relying on one method, but thinking sideways about all the different uh, biology of both bees and elephants. Um, and so the sound can be one of those. Um, and, the, you know, this fantastic work that Robin and Michelle are doing with the pheromones as well. You know, this is a really awesome way of understanding the natural world and using that um, in, in certain circumstances. Again, it's not going to be appropriate for thousands of farmers, but it could be really useful for certain specific sites. So I, I'm always a fan of listening to everything, every idea, every new idea, you know, never, never reject anything because there's always a, a unique thing we can learn from it and there's always a unique site that can use it. Um, so we need lots of new young people coming along with more ideas. Um, and the more we understand the animals first and the animal behavior, that's where we're going to find the solutions to this. 
Yeah, what a fantastic and inspiring message, uh, Lucy. Thank you so much for that. And I, I think we definitely agree that the intersection of, of nature and technology having positive implications for conservation is something that we can all be really excited about. Um, so I think that we're a little bit over on our time. So why don't we, Juan, why don't I throw it to you? Do you have any final comments um, from Future for Nature Academy about this project or experience and webinar? I think for all of us, this project was really, really amazing and super inspiring, also this webinar. Uh, I think these kind of stories are, are the best stories that we can share with uh, anyone and, and to inspire other people to care about nature. So this is really, really engaging and, and sparking the, the spirit of conservation. So this is amazing. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for, for all your talks or, or your contributions and keep up the, the nice work. And uh, yeah, we hope that we can keep collaborating with everyone at some point with citizen science projects or with master's thesis, PhD thesis, because this is such a nice network of people and, and people caring about nature. I think this is really, really important. So for me at least, I learned a lot during this, this webinar and, and reading the paper and everything. I'm more, I have to confess that I'm more a bird guy. So for me, this was super inspiring. And uh, yeah, I think, in, in from from all future for nature academy we really want to to keep working with you guys and, and keep spreading the word of conservation so thanks a lot for all your work thanks so much Juan. yeah that's a fantastic way to to describe it it's just um making people feel passionate about nature in general is a is a, is a great one and i think the beehive fence model is one that really brings people into thinking about about wildlife and about nature and how how we can coexist and create harmony. Um, so Bring the Elephant Home also really wants to say thank you not only to Future for Nature Academy, but also to Miami University, the Pulong Wildlife Research Station, Save the Elephants, Elephants and Bees Project, to Elephants Alive, the Wildlife Research and Conservation Society, and all of the speakers and panelists and everyone who joined us today on Zoom or through the live stream uh, for joining this webinar. Before we close out, we have a video we're going to try to play. Uh, which was filmed during the creation of a beehive fence in the Western Forest Complex in Kanchanaburi province here in Thailand. And thank you yet again to the Save the Elephants, Elephants and Beasts project for supporting the build of that beehive fence. So I think Antoinette, if you can go ahead and try to play that. Let's see if it works. <laughs> Not sure if we're going to have the audio for it, but maybe what we can do, it's not going to work. Maybe what we can do is post the link, the YouTube link in, uh, in, in the live stream recording as well. Or maybe we will have it. Let's see. Thailand's <laughs> largest remaining populations of wild elephants. We frequently see here is elephants coming and eating through crops and causing severe economic losses to people in these communities. จริงๆแล้วการใช้พลังพึ่งในต้องเริ่มต้นอยู่ที่เรามีสามวัตถุประสงค์วัตถุประสงค์ก็คือเราต้องการอยากให้มีเลยก็คือต้องการชีวิต
in a collaboration between the Pulong Wildlife Research Station, Bring the Elephant Home, and the local community in Changsudao, we organized a beehive fence build here at the Community Tree Nursery, where over 10,000 seedlings are produced every year for reforestation efforts in this area. We're really happy to see that this tree nursery, which was previously invaded and um, had some severe damage from the wild elephants, now has a beehive fence protecting it. Trees going around that will provide additional food and habitat roaming area for the elephants, provide a natural food source for the bees, and also will provide fruit and things that the community can collect and sell for additional income as well. Bring the Elephant Home is proud to contribute to and support different activities and human-elephant conflict mitigation methods that are sustainable, holistic, and mutually beneficial to wild elephants, local communities, and the environment in which they live. Mm, they might be pausing there, but we will share the link. Why don't we, yeah, <laughs> why don't we give it a... It's the link is in the chat already. So okay, thank you so much, Juan. <laughs> there we go. All right, if that's the case, then thank you so much to everybody who joined. Um, this has been amazing to share all of this knowledge and experience, and uh, hopefully we can keep the discussion going. And um, yeah, thank you so much for the collaboration and this amazing experience. Remember everyone that we will share the video of the webinar if you want to check it or other things. Thanks everyone. It's great seeing everyone and thanks to all the attendees and participants. It's wonderful. Thanks so much everyone. What a fantastic chat and looking forward to meeting you and seeing you all soon again. Yeah, thank you so much everybody. Like I'm really privileged um, yeah, that we have this whole panel session together and to share experiences and uh, looking forward to collaborate on more projects. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good fun. Thank you.